Hello. God eftermiddag og velkommen til det her mini-VN-døgn. Øh, mit navn er Jesper Christiansen. Jeg er programdirektør herude på DTU. Øh, det er min kollega Ellen Als og jeg, der i dag er værter. Øh, jeg skal lige starte med at spørge en gang, hvor mange her er egentlig ingeniører? Oh, det var ikke overvældet. Hvor mange, hvor mange her, øh, bortset fra VL Gruppe 53, har været herude på DTU de sidste 2-3 øh, år? Oh, det var ikke overvældende mange. Øh, inden vi går i gang, så vil jeg godt lige give en øh, kort introduktion til, øh, til DTU. Det oprindelige DTU det blev stiftet i 1829 af H.C. Ørsted. Og dengang der holdt man til inde i øh, Indreby. Og så i 1959, der påbegyndte man faktisk byggeriet herude på Lundtofte Sletten. Og det tog 13 år, inden man blev færdig. 72, det er sådan en rigtig 70'er byggeri herude, som man fik færdiggjort. Og så flyttede uddannelserne herude. I dag, der er DTU et universitet med 8.000 studerende. De sidste 10-11 år har man haft en støt-støt fremgang, hvis man er et ungt menneske i dag og gerne vil have et job om en 4-5 år, så er det her et relativt sikkert sted at tage en uddannelse. Vi, øh, ud over at være 8.000 studerende, så øh, er vi også et af de universiteter i verden, der har den største ratio mellem øh, studerende og Ph.D'er. Vi øh, har i øjeblikket næsten 1.400 Ph.D'er øh, herude, og øh, langt over halvdelen af dem er faktisk ikke danskere. Og en af grundene til, at øh, vi har så mange udlændinge herude, det er, at DTU er over de seneste, hvad bliver det, 5-6 <coughs> år, gået til at være rangeret som øh, Europas næstbedste universitet. Øh, vi er rangeret som nummer 6 globalt set i den relation, der hedder samarbejde med erhvervslivet. Det har blandt andet også betydet, at øh, DTU investerer voldsomt. Over de næste 10 år skal vi til at investere øh, tæt på 4 milliarder kroner i nye bygninger, nye uddannelser, nye professorer, ny forskning og ny infrastruktur. Øh, det foregår i øh, stor, stor udstrækning sammen med erhvervslivet. Det foregår ved, at blandt andet Novo Nordisk Fonden har investeret en million i øh, det, der hedder DTU Bio Sustainability, som ligger op i øh, Hørsholm. Der ligger herovre bagved, bliver der bygget et øh, institut, som Dansk Undergrundskonsortie og øh, blandt andet AP Møller har investeret også næsten en milliard i, for at finde ud af, hvordan er det, vi får de sidste dele af oliereserverne ude i Nordsøen øh, hentet op. Den del, øh, som øh, Ellen og jeg tager sig af, øh, det er det, der hedder D20 Executive School of Business, eller bare D2 Business i hverdagstal. Vi er en business school, på samme måde som man finder en business school ude på CBS. Det eneste, vi har med at gøre, det er det, vi kalder voksne mennesker. Vi uddanner voksne mennesker inden for businessdiscipliner. Det er den største gruppe, vi har af ingeniører, men det er langt under halvdelen af dem, vi har inde på programmerne, som i virkeligheden er ingeniører. Vi har fire sådan overordnede aktivitetsniveauer. Vi har en, en af landets ældste executive MBA'er. Så kører vi øh, programmer i Corporate Entrepreneurship. Vi har vækstprogrammer, som blandt andet er det, Ellen tager sig af. Og det er den, og der så, ligger på jeres stol. Ja, og så en øh, større og større del af det, vi laver i dag, det er rent faktisk øh, in-company programs. Altså enten hvor vi leverer hele programmer, uddannelsesprogrammer til større virksomheder, eller leverer komponenter i interne programmer. Så det er i al enkelhed det, vi render rundt og laver. Øh, Ellen har, inden jeg introducerer hendes, en, øh, en lille smule praktiske detaljer for det. Der, hvor vi er i dag, er DTU's bibliotek. Og jeg går ud fra, at det her bibliotek ser en anelse ud, anderledes ud, end øh, de fleste andre biblioteker gjorde, da vi øh, gik i skole. Vi har for øh, eksempel fjernet bøgerne. Ja. <laughs> kan I se dem? Bøgerne, de er i kælderen. Øh, og de er i kælderen sammen med... Øh, To store Xbox med flydemøbler øh, og øh, et kæmpestort skakspil og to store eller to øh, fuldautomatiske øh, medialabs, hvor man kan gå ind og øh, optage film til Coursera eller 
hvis en professor han bruger film i sin skal sætte en assignment til sine studerende, så kan han gå ind og filme den, og det bruger man bare sit kort, så går man ind, og så indstiller øh, kamera og lyd og det hele sig efter. Øh, en. Er det ikke rigtigt, gutter? Det er, I nækker derovre. Ja. Um, <coughs> men det, I kan se, de farvede vægge her rundt omkring os, det er de forskellige studenterforeninger, der holder til hernede, og det er åbent område, som øh, folk de, og de studerende de kommer. Øhm, nogle gange er der døgnåbent i nogle perioder. Det afhænger lidt af, hvor i året vi er. I, i aften er der åbent til klokken 10, og vi har så særligt reserveret øh, områder, øh, som de studerende øh, må undvære. Længere op på etagerne, der er der sådan nogle stille områder. Det bliver mere og mere stille, som man går op i, øh, i, øh, på etagerne. Og det er noget, de reserverer, så de kan arbejde i deres grupper øh, længere op. Um, hvad kan vi sige mere om det? Um, vi har uh, praktiske ting for i aften. Ideen er, at vi starter, når Hamishan starter, så har vi halvanden time, hvor at vi ikke har pause. Og der skal I gerne være interaktiv. I får nogle opgaver undervejs af Hamish, um, som vi skal lave uh, to og to, så I har noget med hjem. Bagefter så er der sikkert nogen, der har brug for et toilet. Det findes på den anden side af den store gang, skråt til venstre. I skal endelig ikke gå ind i kantinen, men over på den anden side findes der toiletterne. Når vi er færdige her, så skal vi spise. Der har vi fundet på noget anderledes til jer også. Vi er jo lidt innovative, så I skal have en picnic, og I skal have dåsevin. Og det finder vi her omme bagved. <coughs> Så øh, det er sikkert en ny, øh, en ny ting, for øh, der er ikke nogen store fade, men når vi er færdige, så går vi om bagved og henter vores mad. Og så skal I så ud i grupperne, i jeres VL-grupper, der er skilte på, så hver gruppe har sit øh, område, hvor I så øh, er overladt til jeres øh, egen øh, fortolkning af, af indlægget og diskuterer netværket, hvad I har lyst til. Men inden da, så håber jeg, at I får en rigtig spændende øh, aften med Hamish. Hvis jeg bare kort lige uh, introducerer Hemis, uh, han tager uh, uh, broderparten selv om lidt. Uh, Hemis var i uh, 11 år ansvarlig for alt, hvad der hedder Executive Education over på Aswich, lige uden for London. For et par år siden så besluttede han sig for, at han ville gerne gå over i den næste fase af sit liv, og uh, arbejder i dag som tilknyttet uh, tre forskellige universiteter rundt omkring i Europa, Uh, underviser også en del i Asien, og uh, så specielt for ham i dag, så har vi hængt en lille flyvemaskine op, for det cirka to dage om ugen, der er han i uh, Toulouse, hvor han er nede og arbejder for ledelsen i Airbus og hjælper dem med deres uh, implementering. Og det er i virkeligheden det, det hele går ud på her, det er, at rigtig mange projekter kommer aldrig nogensinde op at flyve, for det at de simpelthen bliver implementeret alt for dårligt. Og det er noget af det, vi arbejder meget med på vores programmer. Det er en ting af, at man kan lære folk at lave verdens vildeste planer, og det ser fantastisk ud. Men sandheden i det hele, det er, at hvis man ikke får dem implementeret ordentligt, så bliver det aldrig til noget. Og det har vi fløjet hemmes over i dag, for at køre en øh, voldsom interaktiv session med jer. Så håber I øh, er med på lejen og spiller med her i dag. Jo, og lige en lille ting. Det er sådan, at vi øh, optager det hele på øh, video, og det bliver kommer på vores YouTube-kanal, og vi regner også med, at uh, VL de lægger det på deres kanal. Det vi ikke har over, men i hvert fald mulighed for, at de af jeres uh, gruppemarkere, som ikke er her i aften, de har mulighed for at uh, få oplevelsen senere. Okay, we're off. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Sitting there, sitting there for 10 minutes, listening to you in Danish. Thank God, by the way, that I can do this in English, because if it was going to be in Danish, it would be a very short presentation. I heard my name five times on the word picnic, so I've no idea what they... <laughs> what, <laughs> I've no idea. And I think you might have cracked my joke, which was going to be, I'm very nervous sitting, un sitting underneath there, but I reckon if it falls down, it's going to be on you, not me. Um, so, delighted to be here. Um, as Jesper may have said in the introduction, I don't know. Um, I'm uh, visiting here in, uh, at DTU. Uh, I'll, I'll do a little bit of introduction to myself. Um, I'm here to talk about this uh, intriguing, intriguing topic of where the rubber meets the road, which is, which is an English expression, I think. I'm not sure whether you use it in your, in your language, whether it kind of translates, but uh, it means that the, the moment at which the plans turn into action, the moment at which the actions turn into kind of impact. Um, it's a phrase that not everyone uses, including my 12-year-old son. I was sitting in my study on Sunday afternoon, um, staring at this, 
thinking about what I was going to be talking about. And he came in. Obviously, he doesn't know this, but he has learned about condoms. So he came, he came into the room and, and looked at what was on my screen and said, Dad, what are you doing? What are you talking about? You know, rubbers, condoms. And I said, I'm going to Denmark. He said, okay. Yeah. Um, seemed to make sense to him. Um, so, so, the, so the kind of more formal title maybe is, is why even well thought through plans um, don't seem to get traction, don't seem to, to um, succeed and what we can do about it. So that's my, that's my title. As I said, a little bit about me. Um, I'm visiting here at DTU. Uh, after 10, 15 years of working at Ashridge full-time, I'm now visiting at Ashridge, at London. I've also just started at Oxford, so I kind of keep moving around between the different business schools. Um, I'm also uh, a strategy director working in the Peel Group. Peel owns airports and ports and um, property developments and renewable energy and Pinewood Studios and all sorts of things in the UK. So I'm, I'm a kind of a part-time strategy director there. I've just stopped being an advisor to the corporate team in Toulouse for Airbus. Um, I think Jesper may have mentioned that. And uh, I've now just taken up the position as an advisor to Grant Thornton, which is a firm of, of accountants and, and consultants. Uh, before that, I did have a proper job. Uh, I worked in the media industry, I worked in the travel industry, in line positions and as, as a strategy director. And, and really all of that adds up to, um, I'm really interested in how things get done. You know, I'm interested in the theory of, of strategy, but I'm also particularly interested in the practice of how things get done. And after a year of working in Toulouse, you know, I've, I've, got the <laughs> I've got some real experiences of what it takes to get things done in a large organization, um, navigating through the politics and, and whatnot. So that's me. Um, wh why are we here? Um, not, you know, why are we here, but, you know, why are we here this <laughs> evening? Um, m maybe the best way of, of explaining why uh, I'm here to talk about this is I was looking at a... a, a a video, a YouTube video, you can look it up yourselves, a guy called Robert Keegan, who I'm going to be referring to later in the, in the, after, in the evening, later in the presentation. Robert Keegan was, was speaking on a, a YouTube video, and he, he told this story, and I thought, that's a really good story. He said, uh, it's kind of a question. Um, Fourteen frogs sitting on a log. Three decide to jump into the pond below. How many frogs are left on the log? Now, I'm sure that the maths geniuses amongst you are, are um, tempted to say 11, but of course the answer is 14, because there's a big difference between three frogs deciding to jump into the pond and actually jumping into the pond. I thought it was quite amusing. I went back and told it to my kids, and they fell for it as well. Um, the point is that when it comes to implementing strategy, it's not what a person says, it's not what a person decides, it's what a person does that counts and that's the thing that I'm particularly interested in and want to cover this this evening organizations full of really good people um, wanting to do the right thing saying all the right things but they're just not doing it so what we're here to talk about this evening is not is not compliance it's not incentivizing people to change it's not forcing people to change it's kind of helping them, <laughs> helping them, um, overcome their resistance. Helping them overcome their resistance. You know, there may be some very good reasons why they're not doing what they say they're going to do. This evening, we're going to be talking about what can we do to help them overcome that resistance, and that resistance that might lie, may lie deep within. And you know, first trained as an accountant, it's taken me a few years to work out that organizations are full of bloody people, um, and therefore we have to treat each person one at a time, which means that we've got to work through conversation, one at a time, colleague to colleague, helping people overcome the resistance that may lie deep within, because that's where the rubber meets the road. You know, the lowest level of change management, the smallest unit, if you like, of of change management is individual to individual, you know, 
working with you know, individual to individual, working through the organization, securing commitment. So what we're here to talk about this evening is how can we use conversation to encourage people to identify why they're resisting change and to help them work out a way of, of um, overcoming it. So the running order is going to be this. Uh, I'm going to present four, four facts. I think they're pretty much facts about the challenge. There won't be anything particularly original there. You'll be kind of nodding and, and joining in, I'm sure. Uh, then I'm going to frame a really important question, which is, I think, the question that I would like you to go away with. Um, curious about the answer to this evening. Um, then I'm going to talk about this idea of competing commitments. Uh, then I'm going to introduce you to a few little cases. The identity of the individuals have been, has been protected. <laughs> so these are not their real names, but you know, there are a few real people I want to, to kind of describe and get you to think about. And then I'm going to ask you to do a bit of coaching. So I'm going to ask you to turn to your, your neighbors and um, have a conversation. In fact, that's how I'd like to conduct the next hour, because that's more or less how long we're going to take. I'd like to conduct the next hour through conversation. If we believe that things get done in organization through conversation, then this, this afternoon, this evening, I want to, to kind of role model that. And I want you to have conversations as we go through the, um, through the session, talking about some of the ideas that I present. Okay, that's it. Enough introductions already. Um, let's, let's get going. So, fact number one. Fact number one is that change requires realignment. Organizations, in order to be successful, in order to turn their strategy into, into action, need to be aligned behind their strategy. So, is this a pointer? No, it isn't. So, um, we make our strategic choices. We decide which market we want to be in. We decide which territory we want, we want to operate in. We, we decide the kind of competitive capabilities that we need to bring to bear. That's clearly not enough. What we've got to do is align behind that strategy our key processes. We've got to align our structure and our, cent our incentives. We've got to align our, our culture, what people believe. We've got to align our skills. We've got to align our leadership style. Fact number one is success requires organizational alignment. This is not an original thought. You know, lots of people talk about this. How much time do you spend thinking about all of those different parts? I'm currently working with an organization which has um, announced a new strategy and has decided to make structural changes. Business units are being crashed together. Um, new people are being brought in to take responsibility for new functions. Structural change. But they've left behind the fact that people need to start behaving in a different way. They've left behind the new skills that need to be required. They've left behind the responsibility on the leadership team to model a new way of working. So fact number one is strategy requires, in order to be successful, strategy requires alignment. Most organizations kind of go for the easy things like, well, we need to send people on a training program, skills. Or we need to restructure formal organization. Very rarely do organizations see the challenge as the whole system being aligned behind the strategy. So just to get us into the swing of things, I'd like you to turn to your neighbor and discuss just for five minutes. That's all we're going to spend on this. I'm going to interrupt you after five minutes, but I'd like you to turn to a neighbor or two or three and think of a change in strategy as an organization that you've been involved with. Think of a change in strategy, and I just want you to talk about where, where was it probably out of alignment? Where was the organization probably out of alignment? You know, did you make a change up here, and actually the skills were never addressed, so we never made progress? Or did you make a change up here, but the new systems were never introduced, and that's why we didn't make progress? Or did you make a change up here, and the incentives weren't changed, the structure wasn't changed, or you see, see my point? So, five minutes on this, I'm going to start the clock, and I'd like you to just turn to a neighbor and play with this a little bit, okay?
If I can interrupt you. Okay. I've started an unstoppable force. <laughs> I've, I've started an unstoppable force. So, you know, I, um, I think as we, as we go through our careers, we, 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 we kind of gather shortcuts, don't we, tools, w ways of kind of speeding up our thinking. I, I've used this little model. It comes from Charles... O'Reilly and Michael Tushman, Charles O'Reilly III and Michael Tushman, Americans. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of kind of quickly thinking about all of the different aspects of an organization that need to be worked on and all of the different aspects of the organization that need to be aligned. Um, we had a meeting at the business school this morning. We had a meeting with a, a, a potential client who came in to talk about their challenge. They were, they were talking about a couple of these elements. Um, very you know, lucidly, uh, and I was quickly running through this model thinking about, but you haven't covered that point, you haven't covered that point. So fact number one, we need alignment, right? We need alignment. Uh, fact number two is that obstacles to change come in different flavors. So this, this comes from Renan Baboyne and Chan Kim um, at INSEAD who wrote Blue Ocean Strategy. Um, towards the back of that book, they've got this model. I found this, use this is another kind of shortcut that I'm offering to you, another way of kind of structuring your thinking. If you've read the book, you'll know it. If you haven't read the book, then here you are, I've done it for you. Um, uh, four things that can get in the way of, of change. First of all, the cognitive hurdle. So this is when an organization is kind of connected, committed to a certain way of working. It can't see another way of doing it. It can't see a, a way out of competing that way. It can't see a way out of, of operating in a certain manner. Is that what's getting in the way of change in your place? That people can't see a different way forward? Or is it they can see a different way forward, but they just don't have the resources, they don't have the cash to to invest to do it the, the other way. Um, so when I was at Asheridge Business School, we had this grand plan um, for a global network. Um, we got international clients, and we knew that those international clients needed um, local campuses. But we just didn't have the resources to, to implement that. Um, or is it that you can see a different way forward, you've got the resources to do it, but you just can't get people minded to change. You just can't get people out of bed and doing things the different way that you need. So is it the motivational hurdle? Or is it that you've, you can see a different way forward, you've got the resources, you've got people up and ready for it, but actually there's some kind of pressure near the top which is um, causing the resistance, causing the inertia. Is it that you've got what, I, I worked with British Airways for a while and the, and the guy there said, we've got a concrete layer. He said, um, I get it, Willie Walsh gets it. So this was the group, uh, Tony McCarthy, he was the group HR director. He said, I get it, Willie Walsh gets it. And all of the people kind of down there in the organization, they get it and they want to change. But we've got a concrete layer of senior managers and I don't know whether to kind of go round them or to kind of drill through the concrete. Is it that you have an organization with some, some kind of powerful vested interests? You can't stop the vetoes. So here's fact number two. As far as I'm concerned, fact number two is that these obstacles to change come in different flavors. So I'd like you to consider, and I'm obviously taking a risk here because it took a while to get you back to the stage, but just have another couple of minutes on this subject. Think of a need for change that didn't happen. Something that didn't happen in an organization where you were working, where you are working at the moment. What was probably the obstacle? What was probably behind it? Was it that there's just people couldn't see a different way? Or was it that we didn't have the resources to do it? Or was it that we couldn't motivate the people down in the organization? Or was it that near the top, there are some bastards that are just blocking it. Okay, 
two or three more minutes on that, have a discussion, and then we're going to move on. So it'd be interesting to find out, it'd be interesting to find out, just from a, a simple kind of show of hands, um, what conclusions you came to in your discussions. So um, how many people here in their conversations identified that the, the need for change that didn't happen was because at the top we just couldn't find a different way of doing things? Was it because of that? So one or two... One or two hands going up, one or two or three hands going up on that. How many people here identified that the, the change that didn't happen was because we didn't have the cash to invest? To invest in the equipment or the people or in the, the, the hit to the profit and loss account before we get the payback? How many people, how many people identified resource as being a, a need? So three, four, five, six hands, something like that. Um, how many people in their conversations identified the motivation hurdle as the reason for something not happening? So how many people... Okay, so that's, that's most. And uh, what about the political hurdle? What about the bastards in the concrete layer? Okay, so everybody's, everybody's referring to that. Um, and, and I think that this is, this is traditionally what we teach you know, in business school, traditional business school teaching is around this. You know, working out the answer, working out the, f the formulation of the strategy, working out the financial business case, the appraisal, etc. Um, I think we need to do a lot more around how you overcome the politics, a lot more around how we deal with that motivational hurdle. And that's, you know, I'm glad that you all put your hands up because that's what we're here to talk about th this evening. Fact number three is that motivation is hard because it shows two faces. And what I mean by this is that there are, you know, one single person can, can be in two places on a particular change. So we've got the, I get it, I'm committed to it, I agree with it, I'm, I'm on board, absolutely, and then absolutely nothing bloody happens. And um, this was the case in some of the organizations that I mentioned earlier that I've worked in. Yeah, people, you know, to your face, say, absolutely, we will do this. I'm committed to this. This is the most exciting thing that's happened. You know, you're a, you're a breath of fresh air. Absolutely, Hamish. And then nothing bloody happens at all. Um, so we've got to acknowledge this. And that's what we're going to be talking about. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about is that ultimately, uh, things get done through conversation. So we've got a new strategy. Um, what's going to change Bob down there in the organization? Is it having the new strategy? Well, of course it bloody isn't. You know? Having a new strategy has a, no significance to Bob, who's down there in the organization whatsoever, certainly if he doesn't know about it. Okay, so we better communicate it. So we do the posters, we do the screensavers, we do the roadshows, we do the video, we put it on the portal. We, you know, we, we have the boss do a kind of a TED talk so that everybody around the organization can appreciate the new strategy. Um, does that change Bob? Of course it bloody doesn't, because job say, uh, Bob's saying, what, what does that mean for my job? What do you want me to do? So we work out the change management plan. We work out what we want Bob to do. We work out what this means for his job. We work out maybe a change in incentives for him. We work out, you know, we have a change program office, which has got beautiful Gantt charts. We have regular reporting, red, amber, green. Does that change Bob? Well, no, it doesn't, because Bob's got a particular reason why he can't do that. Bob's got a particular, you know, interest in the status quo remaining as it is. So does the sit down with the boss change Bob? Well, not if it's a one-off. Because Bob, as I've just said, can say to his boss, absolutely, I, I agree. What changes Bob, in my opinion, is the weekly contact, contact, you know, the kind of relentless contact with Bob, the conversations, the sharing um, different perceptions of the challenge, gaining information from Bob about his resistance. Ultimately, I say that things get done through conversation. Now, if you're sitting here thinking, well, of course then I want you to ask yourself the question, how much of your time do you spend in conversation, one-on-one -on -one with colleagues, talking about their attitude to the change, 
their response, their commitment, their reasons for resistance, how much time do you spend in conversation? That's a rhetorical question. Um, but I'd like, you to, I'd like you to think about it. Um, certainly, somebody's done some research on this, and they reckon that it's a tiny fraction, kind of 2 or 3% of a boss's time is spent in conversation with people kind of down there talking about, not the numbers for this week, but talking about the change that we want people to implement and their reaction to it. So fact number four is things get done through conversation. So here's the big question that I want us to address. How do we use conversation? Because it's not just, you know, did you see the football last night? How about the change? You know, that doesn't really work. How do we use conversation in a structured way to help overcome this motivational obstacle that we've all identified and secure that commitment that we've got to get and secure that alignment? So the big question is this. Here's my exam question, if you like. Here's the question that I set myself in designing this session. Just because somebody isn't doing something, it doesn't mean they're against it. We've got to accept that. We've got to accept that just because, just because my daughter is not doing her extra reading, it doesn't mean that she doesn't want to. So my daughter's a bit of a smart addict. She's 17. She wants to go to an Ivy League university or Oxford. She's been told by her school, it's not enough just to be a scholar. You've got to read, read, read like hell. She knows that. You've got to do extra stuff. She's committed to it. She's, she's going on a tour around the universities. She's absolutely committed to it, heartfelt. But she's not doing it. She's not doing it because she's got, some other concerns. So her resistance isn't because she opposes this advice. It isn't because she opposes this plan. It's because she's got a, a, a sincere commitment to something else as well. So this is the idea of competing commitments. It's not that my daughter doesn't want to do her extra reading. It's because she's spending so bloody long on her existing homework. Why is she spending so long on her existing homework? Because she wants that to be done brilliantly. So her commitment is to doing her existing homework brilliantly. So the point I, I want to introduce here is that resistance isn't about opposition. Resistance is often because an individual can hold two commitments simultaneously and one opposes the other. And the one that opposes the other can sometimes override what they are publicly stating they're committed to do. Does that make sense? Let, let me explain it by talking about this guy. Um, so this is John. He's not called John, okay? But let's say he's called John. So this is John. He's a real person. And John works in a professional services firm. So I've already given away the <laughs> identity of the organization. So John works for a professional services firm. He's a partner. He's a good guy. He's a senior good guy. In this firm... There's a new chief executive. The new chief executive is inspirational. She is focusing the firm on innovation, doing new things, getting ideas into practice quickly, cycling them through, learning quickly, sharing the learning. And John is up for this. He turns up at the meetings and he says, absolutely, we should be doing this. John has come from another firm. He's much more commercial than many of his colleagues. He's come from another firm. He's been in the organization about two years, and he's absolutely committed to this more kind of innovative, collaborative, experimental, pioneering approach that the new chief executive is, is, um, has kind of set as the goal. I'm working with a new chief executive, and I am desperately in need of contact with people like John. So in the meetings, I talk to John. John says, we must talk about this. Yes, 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 yes. He doesn't answer my bloody emails. You know, I follow up the next day. He does not, he literally does not answer my emails. He doesn't acknowledge receipt of my emails. I, I, I kind of go through his secretary. He's really busy. He's busy, he's busy with clients. He's suddenly got a flight. In fact, he's got a client in in Denmark. He's got to fly to 
He's got to fly to um, Denmark. He's got to see a client. Short notice. I've even sat in a meeting room waiting for him to turn up. Secretary's come in and said, oh, we forgot he's got to go. Yeah, this, this is one of the good guys. This is one of the good guys. He's absolutely up for it. He's got the right background, but he's always off seeing clients. You go to his area of the floor where his team sit. They're not there. You know, they've, they're, they're out with clients. So what is this? The guy is committed to this change. He's been a kind of elevated by the new chief executive. He's a role model, and yet he's not doing anything about it. So I go and speak to HR. Tell me a bit about John. Well, he arrived two years ago from blah, blah, blah. What's the culture like at blah, 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 the other firm? Well, it's very kind of hands-on. You have to kind of prove your worth. You have to prove your worth by delivering in front of the client. In the other firm, you are measured on your utilization, of course, and the utilization targets are really high. And in the other firm, people work like crazy. It's important that they charge out their team on a client, you know, 10 hours a day. But he's at this firm now. Surely he should be, he should be following the new chief executive's lead. Well, then we kind of discussed the fact that before John turned up in, in his new firm, in the new firm, there was a big um, redundancy exercise. A quarter of all partners were laid off when we had the downturn, 2008, 2009, 2010. A quarter of the partners were laid off. So here we've got the new chief executive saying, John, I need you working on this new project. I need you innovating. I need you collaborating. I need you to spend less time out, I need to spend more time in, he's not doing it. Clearly, deep down, you've got there before me, clearly, deep down, John is thinking, my status in this firm is about my ability to bring in the business. My status in this firm is actually, whatever the chief executive says, my status in this firm is about my utilization, my status in this firm about keeping my, my people busy, He's got an assumption that whatever the chief executive is saying, that actually deep down, this firm relies on him delivering high utilization rates for his team. So can you see that whilst he is committed to the change, his assumptions are holding him back, his assumptions about what really drives value for this firm. Let, let's try another one. So this is another real person. She's called Helen. Actually, she is called Helen. I forgot to show you. Um, she's the... She's the supply chain lead for a large automotive manufacturer, an American automotive manufacturer with plants in Germany, UK, um, Eastern Europe, Spain. Um, in my capacity as strategy director of Peel, we've been working up some solutions for this manufacturer to drive down the cost in their supply chain. So we go really high. In fact, we get somebody come across from the States who's two or three levels above Helen. And um, in a meeting in the House of Lords, you know, in the Palace of Westminster with Lord Alton there, we, we discuss this plan. The guy that comes across from the state says, yes, we must do this. We can put things onto rail. We can put things onto water. We can take things off road. We must do this. And I will personally speak with this person here. The communication takes place. Helen calls me up. We're really excited about the possibility of working with you to innovate the way that we run our supply chain. We're really excited about the way of driving down costs. This is what the States is really interested in. This is what the UK is interested in. This is what we must do. I meet with her once, twice, three times. You know what, you know what I'm going to say, don't you? Nothing happens. Nothing happens at all. So I start to speak to our people, kind of off the record, you know, in the pub, kind of after a meeting, we kind of go for a bit of a drink. Helen's new to this job. Helen took over from a guy who, who was a rock star. Yeah, he was, the, he was the, the star of this automotive manufacturer in the supply chain area. He was, he was known for innovation. He was known for, so I said, well, surely if she's taking over from a guy that was a rock star that was known for innovation, then surely she should be looking for loads of opportunities to do things even more innovatively. 
but she's nervous about her ability to make this stuff work. She has been in the shadow of this rock star guy that's just moved on. She's been in the shadow of this guy for six or seven years. She's seen how everything that he's touched has turned to gold. So think about it. What's she most concerned about? She's most concerned about she could, ha- she, could, she could be in this job, you know, the shortest tenure that anybody's ever had. She could try something really sexy with Peel. It could completely screw up and she'd be out of a job. Deep down, as I talk with her colleagues, um, and this isn't a picture of her, by the way. This is somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> deep, deep down, she's worried that she's going to screw up. Deep down, she's got what we call imposter syndrome. Deep down, she's concerned that she's got to kind of keep the supply chain going. And if she does anything fancy and it screws up, then she'll be in trouble. So there's an assumption. There's an assumption that she, she's assuming that she can't make this work. So we're edging towards the point here, which is beneath every competing commitment, there's an assumption. And what we've got to do as leaders is flush out one by one through conversation what those assumptions are that are holding back the, the main commitment, those assumptions that are preventing progress. Um, here's a lily pond. People familiar with a lily pond? A lily pond has got flowers on the, on the surface of the pond, and then, st- well, here's a, here's a chart. So up here, we've got the flowers. Let's use this as a metaphor for culture. These are the visible signs of the culture. Yeah, the visible signs of the culture is the behaviors. So here we've got John not turning up at meetings. Here we've got John's team not even there on home office Fridays when everybody's expected to be in the office. Here we've got the visible signs of the culture supported by the values that we can kind of see down through, through the water. The flowers are supported by stems that we can see down through the water. Those values are, in John's case, customer comes first. The customer is the most important thing. We must focus on the customer. We are a customer-centric organization. You can't argue with that, can you? But if we go a little bit deeper, if we go into the, into the muck, into the shit at the bottom of the pond, we find that actually these behaviors are being driven by something which is much more dark, <laughs> which is much more real which is, I don't believe that we can succeed unless I deliver a high utilization rate. I assume that I will be in trouble if I don't get a high utilization rate. I assume that this innovation stuff is not going to work. I assume that if there's a partner redundancy program in, in, you know, in the next year or two, I will be out on my ear. Even though I've done the innovation thing, I assume that I will be out if I haven't been achieving utilization. So think of the culture of your organization as these three levels. The activities, the behaviors, the things that you can see, the values that people talk about, and then deep down, the underlying assumptions. These assumptions can be about what gets me promoted, what makes the firm profit, what industry we're in, what it takes to succeed, what customers really matter to us. These deep, deep underlying assumptions are actually what drive the behaviors. Now, therefore, therefore, we need to help colleagues identify these assumptions. We've got to help colleagues work out what assumptions they hold, because it could be that they're so deep-seated they don't even know that that's what's driving their behavior. It may require people to question their fundamental beliefs. It may require John to question the economics of a professional service firm. Actually, it's not about innovation today. You as a partner shouldn't be worrying about utilization. You should be worrying about innovation. So we're going to be asking John to question his assumptions about professional service firm. We're going to be asking Helen to question her assumptions about her ability And we're going to be asking my daughter to question her assumptions about the quality of her homework. If the important thing is getting into um, Harvard or Oxford, then 
actually, this week's homework is not as important as having some extra reading that you can show off when you go for interview. And of course then, once we've got people to acknowledge those assumptions, to understand those assumptions they hold, it could be that they will choose to remain you know, fixed to their assumptions and beliefs. It could be that they remain in their unproductive assumptions. Now, um, so far I've been speaking conceptually. I want to move to something a bit more practical. The good news is that there is help in identifying these hidden assumptions. Um, Robert Keegan and Lisa Leahy have been working on the other side of the Atlantic on this subject. They've written a book called Immunity to Change, which has got techniques for working with individuals to identify these, these unproductive assumptions. And I'm going to go through the technique in a moment. They've written on the subject of how we can have more productive conversations. They're psychologists that have actually kind of focused on the effects on individuals' health and education. So Robert Keegan talks about the fact that most people do not take their medication. Yeah? Most people do not commit to their diets. Most people, even though they've been told that they are in life-threatening situations, conditions, do not then follow the treatment that they've been prescribed. So Keegan and, and Leahy have been... Um, focusing on, on kind of individual self-improvement. But they've also worked in the area of team improvement, and they've come up with some, some tools. Um, my proposition to you is that I go in the library so that you don't have to. So here is the tool. I'm going to run through it in, um, in theory, and then I'm going to ask you to use it with your neighbors. Okay, so five steps. This is a five-step program. First step. We sit down with our colleague and we say, so what's, what's the big goal? What's the, in Keegan the Leahy language, what's the, what's the stated commitment? You know, is it, um, is it a big ambition that you've got? Maybe think of a complaint that you're always talking about, you know. I wish I could be fitter. I wish I could spend more time with the kids. I wish I could make, you know, this team more innovative. I wish I could make this team more self-managing rather than bloody rely on me all of the time. Okay, so that's your stated commitment. Second step, what are you doing or what are you not doing that's preventing progress with that goal? So this is what Keegan Leahy called the time for some personal responsibility. So this is not an easy discussion to have because the first reaction will be, well, I'm doing everything right, yeah? So we've got to have a face-to-face you know, -face conversation, an in-depth conversation about what is being done or what is not being done that's preventing progress. Not, you know, well, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm innovative already or I'm, you know, I'm committed. No, what are your behaviors? What are your actions? Don't talk about you know, platitudes. Talk about actions and behaviors. Let's talk about observable behaviors and actions, things that you can both agree on. Well, um, John would say, okay, I'm not turning up at the meeting. So, you know, the stated commitment is my chief executive, my new chief executive wants me to contribute to the innovation progress, uh, process, wants, to, wants me to be collaborating with my colleagues, bringing my experience from another firm. That's the commitment. But what, what, what are you doing, John? I'm not turning up at the meetings. What are you doing, John? You're not, you're not even answering Hamish's bloody emails, okay? <laughs> okay. Step three comes in two parts. The first part of step three is, okay, imagine doing the opposite of what you're doing in step two. If you imagine doing the opposite of what you're doing in step two, how does that make you feel? What kind of concern do you have? What, 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 how does that make you worried? So imagine doing the opposite. How does that make you worried? So we say to John, how about turning up at the meetings? How does that make you worried? Well, I'm worried that um, I won't have contact time with my clients. 
If I turn up at the meetings, I'm worried that my utilization rate will go down. I'm worried that my team's utilization rate will go down, okay? That's the worry box. Okay, so now let's think about what's really behind why you do this. By doing this, what worrisome outcome are you committed to preventing? Okay, so this is slightly complicated, so just kind of work with me on this. By doing, by doing this, what outcome are you committed to preventing? Well, John says, well, by not turning up at meetings, I'm committed to preventing low utilization. I'm committed to preventing the image of me as not very productive. So that's your competing commitment. Your competing commitment is preventing low utilization. Your competing commitment is preventing the image of you as an unproductive person. So what's the big assumption here? I want you to brainstorm some assumptions that must be driving this. So we let, imagine we're sitting with John and John says, well, I'm assuming that I will be seen as unproductive if I'm not out with clients. I'm, I'm assuming that I'll be in the, the bad books if I'm not out with clients. I'm assuming that my team will be targeted if they don't have high utilization rates, even on a Friday. And then step five is, so let's test, so let's test that assumption. Let's test whether you are going to be seen as a villain if you have low utilization. Let's test whether your team will be under fire if they have the low utilization. Let's test those assumptions. So can you see how it works? I was looking for nods, but you know, if anybody, let, we'll do an example. We'll, we'll work through an example, okay? Um, and no, in fact, bef be before we work through an example, let me just show you. Th this requires you to think about doing the opposite of something, okay? So I've got, I've got something that I want to show you, which, um, which kind of sums up what we mean by this. Do you want to click across to... Uh, we're going to click across to a, a clip from a Seinfeld. Everybody familiar with Seinfeld? Okay. Speaking of having it all... <laughs> where were you? I went to the beach. Oh, the beach! <laughs> Stop working, Jerry. It's just not working. What is it that isn't working? Why did it all turn out like this for me? I had so much promise. <laughs> I was personable. I was bright. Oh, maybe not academically speaking, but... <laughs> I was perceptive. I always know when someone's uncomfortable at a party. Don't happen over there? It all became very clear to me sitting out there today that every decision I've ever made in my entire life has been wrong. <laughs> my life is the complete opposite of everything I want it to be. Every instinct I have in every aspect of life, be it something to wear, something to eat, it's all been wrong. <laughs> Everyone. Tuna on toast, coleslaw, cup of coffee. Yeah. No, 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 wait a minute. I always have tuna on toast. Nothing's ever worked out for me with tuna on toast. <laughs> I want the complete opposite of tuna on toast. Chicken salad on rye. Untoasted, with a side of potato salad, and a cup of tea. <laughs> well, there's no telling what can happen from this. You know, chicken salad's not the opposite of tuna. Salmon's the opposite of tuna, because salmon swim against the current, and the tuna swim with it. Good for the tuna. Uh, George, you know, that woman just looked at you. So what? What am I supposed to do? Go talk to her. Elaine, bald men with no jobs and no money who live with their parents 
Don't approach strange women. Well, here's your chance to try the opposite. Instead of tuna salad and being intimidated by women, chicken salad and going right up to them. Yeah, I should do the opposite. I should. If every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. Yes. I will do the opposite. I used to sit here and do nothing and regret it for the rest of the day. So now I will do the opposite and I will do something. Excuse me, uh, I couldn't help but notice that you were looking in my direction. <laughs> oh, yes, I was. You just ordered the same exact lunch as me. <laughs> my name is George. I'm unemployed and I live with my parents. I'm Victoria. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, so we go back. So, so what, this, what this requires you to do is to think about the opposite, right? So we're, we're going to play with it. Obviously, you're going to play with it in a moment. Let, let's have another go. Um, I'm going to um, introduce you to a guy called David. Um, in fact, this is David. <laughs> this is a real picture of David, so I'm taking a risk here. So, so um, David works in a large group which sells um, industrial equipment to manufacturers and to construction companies. It has um, grown very fast with um, pretty autonomous business units, okay? Business units which are um, set up around particular product categories. New boss comes in and um, guess what the, what the commitment is? Cross-selling, so we need the we need the business units to to cross-sell. We need we need leads to be um, shared. Yeah, people familiar with this situation? Yeah, we come across it all the time. So um, here's here's David. He's sales director in one of the business units, and um, he's another good guy. Um, he's got the ear of the chief executive. The chief executive has known him personally um, for a, for a number of years. And David is committed to this. Yeah. So you're familiar with the situation. Um, so what do you think he's doing? Well, yeah, this is the interactive bit. Okay, so uh, what, what do you think he's doing? The, there's, there's a pattern emerging, isn't it? Absolutely bloody nothing, right? So... He's, he's not sharing his leads. He's not even putting his customers into the new group um, CRM system so that people can't see who his customers are. He's not um, taking... They had a little scheme called um, bring a friend. He's not taking a friend to see, you know, from another business unit. He's not turning up at the um, group sales meetings. Absolutely not. What, what do you think... Um, if, if we were to ask him, if we were to ask him, imagine doing the opposite. Imagine sharing your leads. Imagine using, putting everything on the CRM. What do you think is the thing that's most worrying for him about doing the opposite? Losing his accounts, yeah. Losing his job. One might lead to the other. What, what else? Yeah. Waste of time because... Yeah, so it's, it's going reduce, to reduce my productivity, and if I reduce my productivity, then my job is in, is in danger. What else? Any ideas? It's even more worrying than, than this, by the way. So he'll get no... So he'll get no credit... For, for doing it, yeah? He'll get no benefit from doing it. Even more, any, any other ideas? Because it's, yeah? He loses, power. he loses power because he's sharing his contacts. Yeah, even more worrying than that, by the way. I found it more worrying than that. The fact is, um, it's not just losing his clients. It's losing his clients because he thinks his colleagues are completely useless. I know this because I've had this conversation with him, yeah? He is not... 
he is not sharing his leads because he knows that in the other business units, the salespeople are completely shit. And if he lets them go in front of the clients, if he lets them go in front of the clients, they're going to embarrass themselves. So we say, well, what, what is the worrisome outcome that you're committed to preventing? Yeah, because remember, that we're not making a judgment. We're just trying to find out why is it that he doesn't want to put his colleagues in. Well, it turns out that he is committed to protecting his company. Yeah. It's more than just himself. It's more than just his, you know, his bonus, whatever. He is committed to protecting his company. He feels that on his shoulders is the responsibility for keeping the idiots away from the important clients. So this guy's got good intentions. This guy's got good intentions. But remember, beneath every competing commitment, there's an assumption. So we have to turn it into... I assume that, and he's saying, I assume that if I shared my leads, if I opened up my clients, my colleagues' incompetence would lose us business. This guy has got the best of intentions. He's not, he's not um, opposing the change. He is resisting it because deep down, he thinks that his colleagues are going to damage the firm. This came out from a long conversation with him. A long conversation with him. In fact, a couple of long conversations, to be honest. So, any kind of questions about, about how we do this? Because the next step is I'd like you to pick up the um, pieces of paper that you've got on your seats and to have a 20, 25-minute conversation with a colleague, with a neighbor, and just start thinking about some competing commitments. Yeah, here's the, um, here's the process. Any questions about it? Because I want you to leave this evening with something practical, yeah? Something practical for making these conversations productive. Any questions so far? Good. Well, the, I will take silence as um, agreement. Um, so let's spend 20, 25 minutes um, having the conversation with your neighbor. You know, you can take it in turns or you can pick one of you. Go through, the, go through the process, make a few notes. And then at the end of this, I'm going to ask you, how was it for you, darling? Okay? Let's, um, let's try and pull this to, together. First of all, I'd be interested in, in your, your thoughts and, and reflections, having the conversation. What were your, um, what were your findings? having the conversation how was it how was it for you it was it why was it a tough discussion okay so so the point there i'm not sure whether you heard that the the point was this does require the person to to open up yeah it does require an honest conversation about what you're doing and what you're not doing that is preventing progress. It also requires an honest conversation about what is it that you seem to be committed to preventing. Um, okay, other thoughts? What else? Yeah. 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 Well, um, you're, you're saying this is, if I may paraphrase, you're saying this is all very well, but at some point, somebody's got to bloody do something. And I think that if we can get people to identify why they're not doing what they've stated they're committed to doing, you know, it's not, you know, John and Helen and David, they're not bad people. They've all said, I want to do this, but they're just not making any progress with it. If we can help them, help them identify why they're not making progress with it, and actually 
The reason that they're making, not making progress with it is because they've got a flawed assumption. Then there's more chance they're going to do it. As I said at the beginning, this is not about you know, insisting on compliance. This is not about incentivizing. This is another way of getting people to participate in the change. And this is about encouraging people to want to do it and free, and free themselves up. Okay, that I'm very pleased because I meant to say what we did with David. So what we did with David was we said, first of all, um, test. If you remember, the, the, fifth, the fifth thing is, whoops, excuse me. The fifth thing is test. What's the next step? What we said with David was um, take some of the salespeople from the other divisions under your wing. Take them out. Give them a, you know, give them a chance to, to, to speak with your clients, with you there, see how it goes. The second thing we did with David, and I'm not sure whether you're, you know, you're going to think this is a bit soft. We said, okay, you're now responsible for working across the group, developing the skills of the salespeople. We were confident that actually the salespeople in the other divisions were good enough. But David, if you think there's an issue, you take responsibility for developing them. Suddenly, it's his problem <laughs> if he thinks that the salespeople in the other divisions aren't good enough. So we gave him some kind of lateral, kind of matrix responsibility for skills development. Yeah? Now, we could, we could have said, just going back to David, we could have said, you're not sharing leads. You know, you're on some kind of disciplinary, you idiot. You know, you're out of the, you know, it's not that, that these people are wrong and that you're right. Actually, you're arrogant, so-and-so. You know, you've got to wake up and understand that you're not the only person, you know, that can walk on water. We didn't do that. What we did was we said, well, maybe you need to be helping them understand you know, how, what good looks like. Is that a bit soft? <laughs> it, it worked. Yeah, he's still there. Yeah. I, I want to go back a little bit before you actually, um, sorry. Um, I want to go back before you actually make the commitment because what I, I was were, uh, considering is why is it that David, before the decision was taken, uh, present his sort of, ideas and, and his concern about that it not, is not going to work. Because in a Danish context, of course, uh, if you have decided that this is what you're going to do, normally you will have involved people in the decision to commitment, and, and then they would be given a chance to, to raise that concern. So, so yeah. is that there part there of wasn't your <laughs> There wasn't that opportunity. Okay, <laughs> I see. Thank um, you. You know, new boss comes in, says we're going to have, he came up with a, a strategy called one, let's say, say they were called Smith, one Smith. And, you know, there's going to be take a mate, take a friend and cross-selling and synergy and maximizing the customer value and selling more products to existing customers. And, and yeah, everybody's up for it. And David says, yeah, I'm up for it. And then nothing happens which actually is the theme of most of my stories, isn't it? Everybody says, yeah, and nothing happens. But actually, I think it is the theme of my life. <laughs> yeah. People say, yeah, and nothing happens. Yeah, which is why I'm here. <laughs> You're wondering, why am I here on the stage, Ron? Um, yeah. Yes, hello. Um, I'm sure a number of us have children, so could you talk us through what you do with your daughter? Okay. Please. Okay. Well, what about getting her to work on her homework? Well, she is scarily self-driven. But, but again, I'm interested. I'm glad that you asked the question because she, she had, let's just go forward to the blank. She had an assumption down here, which is um, I've got to do my homework brilliantly so that I will get good um, marks in my coursework and that will help me get into... Brown and Harvard and so on. That's a flawed assumption. So when, when, and obviously I didn't go through this, you know, step three. Um, but in conversation with my daughter, I don't, you know, it comes out that that's what she thinks. Well, actual, in actual fact, she can, she can reach a certain standard with her homework. 
she's now got to start doing things that will impress an interview. And so we changed you know, her assumption, which is I've got to do brilliantly in my homework. We challenged and we said, well, actually, what you're really committed to doing is getting into these universities. The way to do that is, of course, to do your homework 90%, but then read some other books. So I took her to London Business School. It's close to where I live in DTI. I took her to the London Business School Library last week, and we spent a day with her reading. <laughs> yeah, but why she's driven like that, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> other thoughts, reflections on this? Yeah. Yeah. Then you're probably unlikely to be very positive to reading that to your boss. You're so unlikely to be. You're unlikely to would be willing to talk to your boss about that at least immediately. Yeah. So um, who's better at it, your boss or somebody else? Uh, say. Good. Good point. Good point. I mean, n nowadays in business schools we talk about leader as coach. You know, all leaders need to develop coaching skills. You're right, it, 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 this will require a very kind of honest, sometimes painful conversation. Who else is there? You know, who else is there that's going to tackle David? Who else is there that's going to tackle John and, and Helen? Um, really, who else is there? I mean, tell me. The consultant? The consultant? Always a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that maybe that's why so many individuals now are getting executive coaches. Because um, this is used in coaching, yeah. <laughs> yeah, their group. Yeah, this is why you've got peers and and whatnot. If if we stick to observable behaviours and actions, it makes the conversation easier. Because you can say, you know. David, I, I know that you're up for this group selling thing, one Smith. I notice that you're not putting your clients on the CRM. I notice that you're not sharing leads. I notice that you're not taking. Now, I want to talk to you. You know, that's a fact. Yeah, I want to talk to you about um, what, what, what would worry you if you started doing that? What are your concerns? if you started putting your clients on there. You know, I'm not making any judgment about whether you're a good guy or a bad guy, just what are your concerns? So if your concerns are, you know, m messing up the client relationships by putting your client, what is it really that's driving your concern? You know, it's, it's a questioning thing. And I think it might be easier than getting David by the collar and saying, come on, share your leads. I think it might be easier. But what, what do you think? You have concerns about... Well, I was, I was th sitting and thinking that maybe the issue is more that you should do it earlier. <coughs> that part of a change process is that you ensure that people are open and, and comfortable with revealing their inner concerns about yeah. the change that's going to happen. Yeah. So that you bring these things out earlier so it doesn't become a you're not doing what you promised, but it becomes more what do you need in terms to yeah. feel comfortable. I, I've, um, particularly with the John situation, I've noticed that you have those meetings and people say yes. You know, it's this two-faced thing. I don't mean two-faced in a bad way. It's just people say yes. I want to do it. And th I mean, for instance, I want to exercise more. I really want to exercise more. But I don't. You know, I need somebody to take me through this. Because deep down, there must be something that's preventing me from exercising. John want, wants to be part of his new, the new chief exec's kind of inner team. So if we consult John early on, he'll say yes. It's then when we notice that the action is not taking place that we have to have this kind of discussion. You know, it, as... Um, Robert Keegan talks about, it's when we notice that people aren't taking their medication that we need to have this kind of discussion. And, and one, of the, um, one of the materials that you could look at on the internet about Robert Keegan, he talks about, I think it's on one of the videos, it could be in one of his books, he talks about an individual that isn't taking his medication. And after going through this process, it turns out that 
this guy assumes that if you're the kind of person that keeps taking these all these tablets, you'll be like my father was, taking 20 tablets a day and being a sick and weak man. And that's why he's not taking his medication. Because he assumes that people that take their medication, all of those tablets, are just kind of surrendering to illness. Yeah. So it's only when you notice that people aren't doing things that you can start to go through this. Sorry, that was a rather um, <laughs> low motivating <laughs> story, but it's a in- powerful story, I think. Okay, so um, I'll do a little summary. What have we done? Um, we've talked about four facts. We need to be aligned. We need organizations to be aligned. Six facets need to be aligned. We need to understand that there are four obstacles and different techniques will be used with different obstacles. If it's the political thing, we need to work out how we're going to deal with the concrete layer. If it's the resource thing, then we need to work through the economic model. If it's the can't see a different way of doing it, we need some some strategic thinking. If it's the motivation thing, if people can't be bothered to act, then maybe we need this kind of technique. The third fact was motivation has two faces, and it's only when people stop, you know, aren't doing things that we notice that their publicly stated commitment is not, is not following through. And then the fourth point is, and, and I strongly believe this, and uh, I'd be interested to talk to you about it over our picnic, that the unit of making change in organizations is the conversation. It's not the PowerPoint, it's not the email, it's not the the one-to-many speech, it's the conversation. So those are my four facts. And then then my big message from this is that it's not that people oppose the change. It's not that people oppose their goal. It's that they've got some other commitment to some other goal that's getting in the way. And that commitment might be based on a flawed assumption. And our job as bosses or coaches or consultants, is to help the individual identify that assumption and then start to test it with actions so that we can give people confidence that they can let go of what you know, of this outcome that they're concerned about preventing. They can let go of that and wholeheartedly go for their stated commitment. So that's me. Thank you very much for your attention and your, your participation. We've now, <laughs> we've, we've now got picnic, right, Ellen? We've now got picnic. Yeah, we also have questions, perhaps, if um, there are any burning questions. Uh, uh, yeah, more questions. Bring them on. <coughs> um, I think that you know that every time you start on a new uh, project, you will encounter this situation. Yeah. And in order not to lose time, waiting for people not to do what you expect them to do, and even expecting that they won't do mm. what you expect them to do, how do you start this early on so that you so don't have to wait for them so not to perform? Yeah, so this relates to a point that was made earlier yeah. about can we, can we um, head this off at the pass, right? Um, yeah, of course, we can. We can, we can do all that we can to um, involve people, uh, we don't want people to be victims. We want people to be con- you know, co-creators of the change. And that's going to be a way of getting them more motivated. Um, I'm a big fan of what the business schools call social mechanisms. You know, ways that we can engineer the involvement of people in things. And there are lots of formats. There are, there are consulting forms that take around different formats for these social mechanisms. The workout at GE is a famous example of of a way of engineering the collaboration of people so that they get, you know, they get the buy-in early on. Of course, I'm a big fan of that. And then what happens if they don't act? That's where this comes in. So I, th- I think you're right. And I, th- I think we've got to do everything that we can early on, and then we've got to be prepared to do this when nothing happens. Yeah. 
Any other questions, thoughts, observations, words of support, words of... Lots of support for the, uh, the local conversation, but yeah. it does require that you're, if you want to change an entire organization, that you get your middle layer on board, right? Yeah. Because those are the ones who will have the local conversations. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's left a little bit out yeah. of this, right? We're looking yeah. at one-to-one, -one, but you really have to have that middle layer on. Yeah. This is, this is, you know, when I talk about boss, I'm not talking about chief executive to shop floor. I'm talking about every, everybody in the kind of, in the hierarchy. I think, you know, I'm a bit of an e evangelist on this. I think everybody ought to be having these sorts of skills because all the way down the, down the organization, there will be pockets of resistance coming from concern. So yeah, it's not about the top team. This is about everybody having this. So by the book. Yeah. Any more questions? Or are you uh, dying to get your picnic? For the picnic? Uh, we've we've made it sound big and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very small. Okay. Uh, the tiny picnic is waiting for you behind uh, the wall and the screen. And Hamish will be here during uh, our the rest of our evening. And he will come round to your groups. And you can uh, have one-to-one -one conversations or group conversations with him. Thank you, Hamish, once again. Thank you.